Okay, so it's my great pleasure to have uh, Nathan, uh, Nathan uh, Kroc to give us a talk on the machine learning, which is a very active and hot topic uh, these days. So today his talk's title is Replantation Learning. Welcome. Sure, thanks. Um, all right, so as many of you may know, um, our lab, myself and Juan and Dr. Erlebacher, we just kind of created our new little group about a year and a half ago, calling ourselves the Intelligence Lab. It's our new research interest of trying to learn about uh, machine learning and trying to make our foray into that field. So it has been a bit of a daunting task, seeing as it is such a hot topic, there's a lot of stuff to learn because everybody keeps figuring things out, unfortunately. So the more we know, the more we seem to not know. Thanks. Um, so today is mainly, we, we spent about a year trying to go directly down this path. So I'm gonna start off by uh, trying to introduce a lot of you to the basics of machine learning and what representation learning is gonna be about. And then once we get at the very end, um, I can share some of the research things that have been be, that have been taking place in the field and some of the questions that we have been asking. So, as is the case with pretty much everybody who's interested in machine learning, we're interested in the, the artificial intelligence, you know, where we're eventually going down that road. And we have to keep in mind some of the big grand scheming questions um, that, we're, that we're aiming ourselves towards there. Uh, first and foremost, artificial intelligence needs knowledge, right? Fundamentally, they have to have some sort of understanding about the world around us. But not only that, they need to have an operational form of that knowledge. They need to acquire knowledge, and they need to be able to use it and interact in our world. What's more is they need learning, right? So learning, um, I am coming to define it as simply learning where to place probability maps. Okay, so I'm going to hope that maybe towards the end of this, that might be something that makes sense to you guys as well. Um, but essentially, it boils down to conceptually, um, how can I change what I just did to get better at what I'm trying to do? Okay, so that's that's how we boil that down. I mean, this this can uh, be as simple as something like optimization that you think about optimization for standard uh, regression things to that effect. Um, but it can become much more complicated in machine learning, which is why we have this field now. We need generalization. So just because I get really good at this one task, I need to be able to take these skills and apply them to something else. If I'm faced with something I haven't seen before, how can, how well can I do? Um, given what I've already seen. Um, we're going to talk about the curse of dimensionality, or if, what it's so called, that's some of a, somewhat of a misnomer, as we'll, as we'll come to see. Um, and we'll see how it affects learning, and we'll see what we can do to stave it off. And then finally, this is kind of what representation learning can be boiled down to, disentangling the underlying explanatory factors. So this has a very murky esoteric kind of notion in all kinds of fields you know, think of pca you think of you know clustering unsupervised learning all these different things but the root behind all of it is this concept of representation learning somehow trying to understand these um, uh, unobservable factors that are influencing the variation in the data that we see and trying to tease apart what these are and how they affect um, the, the task that we're trying to operate on so this is what we're going to do so we'll just start off very quickly with some basics, catch everyone up. Uh, also, if it is okay with you guys, it would uh, please me greatly if you would ask questions during the talk as opposed to uh, waiting until the very end. Um, I think it's more pedagog pedagogical for what I'm trying to do here, to make it more interactive. So ask any questions, raise your hand, and, uh, and interrupt me, please. So super high level, what is machine learning? It is an algorithm that is able to learn from data. Super, super simple. If we want a little bit more of a concrete explanation, we can look at uh, how Mitchell defined it in 1997. It is a, a program, it said, to learn from experience with respect to some task and performance measure if its performance at those tasks improves with experience. Okay, so it seems kind of straightforward, but let's talk kind of what these things can mean. So tasks. In machine learning, you can be looking at things like classification, um, and handwritten characters, right? Uh, you go to the all the ATMs nowadays and you slide your check into the ATM and it's able to, you know, detect all of the characters for your name, the numbers, and it can catch that for you automatically. This is taking care of classification. Uh, transcription, right? Turning speech into uh, text or even translation. You, everybody uses Google Translate nowadays, right? Anomaly detection. Uh, security systems are interested in things like these. Some guy walking through the airport, he looks somewhat like an anomaly, right? These kinds of things are security threats. Um, and then even synthesis, right? So we talked about transcribing speech into words, but what about turning words back into speech? Synthesizing actual speech from the words themselves. This is, a, this is kind of what the culmination of machine learning is coming into nowadays, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, performance measures. So we're talking about accuracy and error rate. Um, ultimately, 
these things are really complicated because think about a standard regression task. You ask yourself, um, am I interested in penalizing my algorithm for uh, small, for frequent small errors, or am I interested in penalizing it for few large errors, right? These tiny little things that you define in your performance measure are going to significantly affect the performance of the algor of, of, of the task uh, that you're trying to, to work on there. So uh, this, is, this is a bit of a complicated thing. And experience, um, this is data. Uh, this is data and it's feedback from data, right? So uh, there's another branch of machine learning called reinforcement learning where you operate on some world, you're embedded in the world, and you do something to the world, and then the world provides feedback on your action. That feedback is what we're going to consider experience as well. So not just the data set, not a bunch of pictures and you learn from it. That's just one type. You could also be interactively uh, uh, maneuvering around in your world at the same time, like humans do. All right, so let's start off very simply. So what, what we're going to call easy learning is this task here. Let's say we have some true unknown distribution and we acquire uh, a lot of training examples. Now we're tasked with trying to predict some continuous variable y uh, given some, some value x. So this is easy because um, the training examples that we have are able to cover the variation in the distribution. So the learn function, I mean, you can chalk this up to just a simple in interpolation or approximation. Uh, for most people. But, of course, this is only a, a, a very simple case in low dimension. We're going to be dealing with AI tasks, which are operating on data that exists in hundreds, thousands, even millions of dimensions. And things become quite, uh, quite a bit more tricky, as we're going to see. So, we can easily now predict this continuous variable y given x, because we've learned this function based on the data. And it's not perfect, but it's close enough. And there's a lot of literature to get these closer and better. Right? But machine learning is looking at much more complicated data. So this is easy learning because the data that we have matches the variation. It covers the variation in the actual true distribution. All right, now what allowed us to do this? The algorithm that we implement to do this assumes smoothness. All right, so what we're going to be talking about over and over are these priors, these priors that we use when we learn and what the priors are that we need to do better learning. We, we talk about smoothness, which essentially says, um, if x is approximately equal to y, then f of x is approximately equal to f of y. Okay, these are the assumptions that you assume when you're doing something to this effect. And it works because we have enough points to capture all the variation in the data. That is why our learned distribution is very close to the true unknown distribution. All right. So as we said, though, true AI tasks exist in very high dimensions. So let's talk about what the curse of dimensionality is. Um, and what it is not, right? Because uh, it's commonly mis misrepresented um, in, a, in, a, in a lot of blogs and things online. So let's make sure we know what this is. But let's assume that we're in one dimension for a moment, and we have some distribution, some random variable, and we want to see what it's doing. So we discretize into 10 different bins, and we just observe what's going on, filling up each bin, and we get some sort of a distribution describing what it does. All right, that's, that's fine. Um, we only have 10 different bins, so we can collect enough data to show the variation in what it's actually doing through its distribution. It's not a big problem. But what if we now move to two dimensions? So in two dimensions, we now have 10 different bins for each of our variables, each of our random variables. So now we have 100 different positions. Right? And what we're seeing is as, as the number of relevant dimensions for the data increases, the number of configurations of interest may, may grow exponentially, not always, but they may. And this is why, this, this would be considered like an upper bound of, of problems. This is as worse as it could get, but this isn't the real problem. The true problem is something else, and that's what we're going to look at. So with enough examples uh, falling into each of these regions that we're trying to classify in, um, general algorithms can, can, do, can do just fine. And this is because, again, they're exploiting the smoothness uh, assumption. Right, but if we go up to three dimensions, now we have a thousand positions, four or five dimensions. You have so many possible configurations that you can't possibly get a, 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 uh, an observation or a data element for each and every one of these little voxels. So, and again, machine learning operates in millions of dimensions. So we need to find out some way to work around this. All right, dimensionality is not the real problem, as we said. What is the real problem? So if we are trying to learn a function that has a lot of variations, even if it's in one dimension, 
this function can be difficult to learn. All right, the, the problem isn't the dimensionality. The problem is the variation in the data. All right, it turns out that uh, if you're using a simple Gaussian kernel machine, you need at least k examples to learn a function that has two k zero crossings along some line. And even more, you can make an upper bound uh, for a Gaussian kernel to learn some maximally varying function in its dimensions. Uh, over d, you need uh, o of 2 to the d examples. Right? That's impossible in millions of dimensions. That's some work that was recently done. Not recently done, a long time ago there by the NGO. Um, so this might be more aptly called the curse of variation. I don't know. I mean, it's going to stay called the curse of dimensionality. But the real problem that, you're, that we're faced with is the intrinsic variation in the data. I mean, we could, we could be in a million dimensional space, but the actual distribution could be very smooth on some, it could be on a plane, it could be on some hyperplane and be completely smooth and one dimension less in, the, in a hyperplane. And that itself could be easily learned with PCA, uh, SPD, standard techniques, right? So it isn't the dimensionality that's a problem, it's the variation in the data. All right, and the reason that it's a problem is because real data is very complicated. The actual data that AI tasks are faced with do not behave nicely at all. Uh, they exist in thousands of dimensions, as we said. They're highly curved manifolds, uh, and they have many overlapping and intersecting sub-manifolds. So this is a very poor representation of a complex manifold for the uh, digit 4 from the MNIST data set. It is nowhere near this smooth. Um, for example, along this one axis here of variation, we see that this is how the digit rotates as you move along this axis here. And along this axis here, you get shrinking transformations. You know, there might be, what, seven, six, seven, eight different geometric transformations that you could think of for objects, rotation, scaling, depends on the dimensions and exactly what you're looking at. Right? And that's just, for, um, that's just for the geometric transformations. What about different colors, different shadings? There's all kinds of uh, other variations in there. Now, what we need to consider to understand why these manifolds are highly curved is let's look along one simple dimension. Let's just take a look at one pixel there and see how the value of that pixel changes as we rotate and scale and move the four around. It's going to be small, and then it's going to be large, and then it's going to be small, and then it's going to be large. Right? So essentially, the, the amount of curving, the curviness, I guess as you want to say, in a manifold is proportional to the intensity in the image as well. So that is why, at least for images, and this happens to be the case for a lot of other data sets and, uh, that is of interest to AI, um, these high dimensional manifolds are very curvy. So how do we start uncovering structure? So we talked about uh, just the simple interpolation approach. So if we have some empirical distribution, we, we know, because we're given the data, that these are a reasonable configure, this is a reasonable configuration for X and Y to start with. Now if we employ the smoothness prior, what can we say? Well, we can say that if I see another observation that's somewhere close to one of these, likely it's going to assume a similar value. So we just go ahead and smatter this with a little uh, blob of probability around each, each observation, and we can get a, a decent, uh, we get a, some decent performance. But this is insufficient because in high dimensions, as we've just seen, this smoothness prior falls apart because curves, the, the manifolds in high dimensions are not smooth. They're not even remotely smooth. So the question becomes, how do we do this? To do this, we have to actually guess structures. That's what we're going to be talking about today is, is this notion of uh, we're using Bayesian inference meets, meets deep learning, trying to put these two together and actually learn the distributions um, ahead of time. So this is going to require a lot of different priors, and we'll slowly look at these different priors and why we should, why we should be using them. Um, and that'll come together. So ultimately, can we hope to generalize non-locally? And uh, yeah, we can, but we need good priors. So that's what it's going to come down to. So what sort of priors do we need to sort of fight off the, uh, the, the, the problems we're facing in high dimensions? So before we get into high dimensions, we just talk a little bit. I've been throwing this word manifold around. Um, so a manifold essentially is a connected region. It's a, a set of points that are associated with, so each point has like a neighborhood of points around it. Now, in machine learning, they don't, they don't stick to the standard mathematical def definition of manifolds. They use it in a bit more of a vague, esoteric, uh, something that can be learned and manipulated and translated uh, upon. That's kind of the, how they deal with uh, manifolds here. So we're going to keep it somewhat vague as well. But uh, this is important because if it's a manifold, that means it has a neighborhood. And if it has a neighborhood, that means that there exist transformations that allow us to move and navigate across the surface. Okay, so that's how you think of a manifold. Think of, for example, Earth. It's a three-dimensional manifold. Yeah, to all of us, it appears roughly two-dimensional. 
right? We're trying to somehow learn some lower dimensional information in these manifolds. You might think, for example, um, addresses, right? An address is a one dimensional thing, right? It's on, it's on a road and you get one number on, on one dimensional road, yet it exists, it's embedded in a three dimensional space, right? Four dimensions, if you wanna argue physics, right? So, so this is what we're working on. So how do we learn this stuff? We, we see over here a whole bunch of data and we assume, well, this is random. How do we figure out what's going on? But it turns out that in some cases, there could be some underlying manifold that actually gave rise to the data. This is the generating distribution underneath. And our goal is to try and learn these, because right? then we can reduce this complex data down to one dimension as we just parameterize our way along that manifold. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about neural networks, because everything nowadays in machine learning uses neural networks. So I'm, again, going to assume you have a sort of high-level knowledge of it. Um, again, please interrupt me if you have any questions about any of these details, because I'm going to kind of, I can't spend too much time talking about the little details. So but let's, let's think a minute for a linear classifier. This is a simple two-node neural network with one output, and this is a you know, soft max, soft max act activation function where we're predicting one class or another. So it's just a linear classifier. If we're posed with a data set that comes like this, this is about the best we can do with a linear classifier. All right, it has a little bit of misclassification here, a little bit of misclassification here, but the rest of it does pretty good. And that's because we're trying to cut this, this space with a line, and there's no possible single line configuration that we can, there's no way to move a line across it such that these two things are separated, at least as it currently stands. All right, but it turns out that if we use a nonlinear classifier, we add an extra hidden layer here in the middle where each of these nodes are um, using the hyperbolic tangent function, we can now successfully classify it. Now this is how classification is normally taught. Most textbooks, they show this kind of thing. But what they don't show, and I'm really glad the, oh, the, this the data came from somebody named Christopher Ola, and he put this stuff together. I'm really glad he did this because there's a lot more going on here than just looking at, okay, now we're able to classify things in this XY space. Because what actually happened is we had a homeomorphism. We took this space of XY, and it went through a transformation here, and it completely contorted the space. It turns out that if instead of, instead of plotting the classification in the XY space, we plot the classification for this new two-dimensional space that it was transformed into, we see this. So what we did is we transformed, manipulated, stretched, contorted the space such that we can now slice it with a straight line. Because remember, that's all this is. This is a linear classifier. So this is classifying things linearly. So somehow, whatever's coming into it, it is able to successfully uh, distinguish these two regions. So that, that means there was this transformation taking place uh, in that hidden layer there. Now, this is important because we're starting to see a little bit more about what's going on with these manifolds. Right? This, this right here was our original manifold, and we contorted and stretched the space such that we were able to separate these factors of variation, these explanatory factors in the data. All right, so here is it working on a different data set, and this is uh, iteratively while training. It's learning different sort of contortions and stretchings, and here with a certain type of architecture, it works out just fine. But over here, try as he might, he's just going to fail miserably, unfortunately. So it turns out that um, the reason that was, these are actually very contrived, simple cases. If we just threw like you know 30 or 40 nodes in the hidden layers, you could solve all these no problem. Uh, we're using very small networks to try and get the point across. But the point that it's coming across is very important, and it's something that I'm going to bring up again a little bit later on. And this example here should make it a little more clear, hopefully. So again, we now have two distinct regions that are impossible to separate in two dimensions. There is no such line. There is no such homeomorphism that can be done to make this happen. Why? Because homeomorphisms, they do not fold space, they do not break space, they simply stretch and move around, move space around. So there is no such transformation that can be done so, so that we can classify this correctly. All right, so why is that? Well, the reason is, is because we're only using two nodes, right? So I'm, I'm restricting myself to a two-dimensional homeomorphism. What if I allow us to do a homeomorphism in three dimensions? Then it becomes trivial. Adding a third node, suddenly now we're able to just stretch this manifold apart, the dot comes out and the circle goes down, and now you get a nice, clear hyperplane separating these two. Classification is trivial once again. OK, so this is a problem. OK, so what is this hinting at? This suggests that if the actual true data generating distributions themselves are complicated or entangled in some manner, 
then we as practitioners need to have information a priori about the structure of these manifolds so that we know how many nodes we need to be able to perform these homeomorphisms. Right? It's sort of a uh, data dimensionally dependent homeomorphism that is undesirable because in high dimensions, we can't possibly know the structure of these manifolds a priori. So what do we do? Throw hundreds and thousands of nodes at it? Well, that's what everyone's been doing for a long time, but you know, that's, that's only gonna work for so long. We need, we need smarter techniques. We need to know more of what's going on. So the true data generating manifold here is we have uh, two links. I guess uh, they call this uh, an ambient isotopy in, in uh, topology. But no matter what we do, stretching this in three dimensions, once again, you can't, you can't unlink these two links here. It's just not going to happen. Throw a fourth node in there, and it happens trivially. Okay. So the point of this example is to show us that we have this sort of data, this dimensionality dependent homeomorphism for classification problems that are frustrating and dealing with really high dimensions. How do you know how many you need to have? Right? So that's something that we want to try and get, get around. So finally now, we, we can move towards some of these priors that we're talking about to help us get around that. So AI task is, as we've said, thousands, millions of dimensions. It's very complex, big, scary space. I hope you, if you don't remember anything today, the, the universe of data is scary. All right, but we can't hope to learn these high dimensional manifolds. Um, you know, millions of dimensional spaces. I mean, think about just trying to do interpolation in 3D. That's already a complicated problem, and right? doing interpolation in even higher dimensions, it's, it's uh, intractable. So, but manifold learning algorithms, they're able to work around this by assuming that most of the high dimensional space exists of invalid inputs. So what does that mean? Well, that means that if I take one of these images here, and let's assume for a moment that it's 28 by 28 like MNIST, then that image exists in 784 dimensional space. That's a big, complicated, scary space. But the idea is that most data that we're interested in occupy a very small area of that space. Okay, and you, can, you can reason this out to yourself by doing a simple ex experiment. Think about taking an image and randomly choosing a particular pixel value for each pixel through it and assume at what state are you actually going to get the picture of a face or a baseball or a car, right? Pretty much never. You're just going to get static. We've all seen this. And this turns out to be true for things. You've heard of uh, the monkey typing you know, to generate Shakespeare, right? It's uh, infinitesimally small, the probability of generating even a, even a simple coherent sentence. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to be working with this first assumption that data exists in low dimensional manifolds in these high dimensional spaces. OK, so this is the manifold hypothesis that is underlying a lot of the state of the art techniques today. Uh, the probability distribution over things of interest in AI, images, strings of text, naturally occurring sounds, are highly concentrated. Uniform noise essentially never resembles structured inputs from these domains. Okay, but this is not sufficient to show that the data itself lies on a reasonably small number of manifolds. All right, so we've, we've convinced ourselves that they exist in concentrated areas, but we haven't convinced ourselves that they're somehow connected and there's there could be a bunch of small little density spots all over the place, right? How, how, do we, how do we work around that? Well, what we do is we can, I mean, there's a conceptual argument at least that we can say, think about taking a cup in your hand. You move the cup, you rotate the cup, you turn it, right? How, all these small little transformations that you do to the cup is not going to change its configuration on that manifold tremendously. This here is a digit and we're generating, we, we've learned the, den, the, the, the data generating distribution for the MNIST data set and now we just move slightly around, perturb ourselves along the manifold and see what happens. And we see that the six is still a six and the one is a one, it becomes a seven, goes back to a one, right? So these small little transformations are convincing us that these manifolds are, uh, that they're connected, that small, small perturbations from a location on a manifold doesn't tremendously, uh, it doesn't, doesn't, uh, so there's categories on these manifolds, right? And the idea is that you don't want to move a little bit and then suddenly get a miscategorization. So this here is an argument that says if you move around slightly on some surface inside of a, uh, a category, you're going to stay within that category. Right now, again, this is another one of those priors, and it's true most of the time, but we always have to remember the assumptions that we make for our algorithms. It's not true all of the time. All right. Now, again, these were just conceptual arguments right, this to help build some intuition about it, but it has been shown by many rigorous experiments uh, over the years that uh, for data sets of interest to AI, these two assumptions holding the manifold hypothesis has been satisfied. All right, so now this is the big, the, 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 this, this is the big cheese here. So this is the trick for getting around the, the curse of dimensionality. 
So the majority of machine learning techniques that we're all familiar with, the, the things that we've looked about for a long time, uh, clustering, uh, you know, interpolation, extrapolation, all these things. Um, essentially, if you remove yourself, for most of them, if, if you remove yourself as far enough away, every single one of these techniques are just breaking the in input space into regions. That's what they do. Uh, you know, clustering, you're going to have some sort of centroids. For decision trees, you've got some uh, you know, piecewise half planes that's slowly partitioning away the space away. Right? All these different techniques are breaking the input space up into regions. So what's the problem with that? The problem is that for each one of these regions, we're going to need one parameter to describe that region. And this is sort of the, the, the doom for all of these techniques. That's why they're all doomed. To, to fail in high dimensions on AI tasks. That's why they don't work on AI tasks. Because the number of parameters that you need to represent all these different categories, all the different underlying explanatory factors, it grows linearly with the number of parameters. So the number of distinguishable regions grows linearly with the number of parameters. So if we go up again into really high dimensional space and we've got a lot of, dis a lot of uh, uh, factors that are of interest, we need at least uh, at least an equal number of both parameters to try and represent all that complexity. Okay, so how do we get around that? I mean, that, that was the idea when we looked at the voxel with all the little cubes. We need one example in every single one of those little cubes, right? And when we go into higher dimensions, that's going to fall apart. How do we get around that? So this is the notion of distributed representations. This is the, the, shiny, the, the knight in shining armor who comes to save the day for machine learning. So things like factor models, PCA, uh, restricted bulletin machines, neural networks, sparse coding, uh, deep learning in general, are all leveraging this notion of distributed representations. So what happens here is we're, we're going to partition the space again, just as we did before, but this time, somehow, we're going to get some exponential gain in, in, uh, in the different regions that we're able to create with the number of parameters. So as, as we realize, when we go into high dimensional space, we're, we're being confronted with an exponential blow up of information. So what do you do when you're confronted with exponentials? You fight it with more exponentials. So what we've got here is a representation technique that allows that grows exponentially. So here's the way that it works is, let's say, for example, that we have an x and a y location, and we have three different output nodes here. Instead of allowing each node to have its own region, we're just going to allow this node to partition space altogether. So everything on this side of the green line has a value of 0. And everything on this side of the green line has a value of 1. And so little by little, even with only three nodes now, we're able to classify this uh, two-dimensional space into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 different regions. So it grows almost exponentially. And so, I mean, think, for example, uh, male. So this is male, female. This is going to be uh, dark hair, light hair. And then this is going to be tall, short. Right? If you take some new example, and it doesn't fall exactly into any one of these regions, that turns out to be OK. Because you can generalize non-locally with this technique. As long as it has some things in common with things that you've already seen before, you can place it somewhere. All right? If you were using the techniques before, you're confronted with something you haven't seen before, there's no way to put that anywhere. You need a label. You need some sort of uh, some information about the space where it belongs to, to label it. So this technique allows us to generalize non-locally as well. So this is, again, going to be one of the priors that we're going to be leveraging when we're trying to move forward in uh, representation learning. So before we move on, this is basically all the basics that we're keeping in mind. First, the goal is to try and find out where to place probability math. That's learning. Okay? And we're going to see a little bit more of what that means. We're trying to find out, given some examples, find out where to place that probability math. So again, the only one thing I want you to remember, super high complex data. Now. Uh, we'd like to move away from the dimensionality dependent homeomorphisms that I talked about. Right? We'd like to come up with some sort of a mechanism which allows us to uh, choose a number of nodes in the hidden layer that don't depend on the actual uh, interactions of the manifolds that we're, we're dealing with. Something that can, that can uh, be broad enough that's able to represent all the factors of variation without being constrained by that. Because that's information that we just can't know a priori. So generalization for complex, highly variable data is difficult, as we talked about. You know, using the, all of the smoothness, the smoothness assumption and things we talked about before, it's very difficult. Insufficient prior. So distributed representations in green. Green is good. Green means go. That is a, is a great thing. It combats the curse of dimensionality for us. So 
any AI learning task that we're using for high dimensional data, we want to leverage this distributed representation. So good priors allow us to generalize in the presence of high variability. That's what we just talked about. And with all of that information, we can now move forward with what representation learning is, now that we have the basics. Um, so this is actually going to be, this is going to be, I like this quote, because it sort of summarizes where we're at with machine learning. For the longest time, we were just trying to find patterns or make some predictions based off of some, some relatively obvious uh, changes in the data, we've gone so far forward now that not only are, are, we, are we able to do all of those things, we're actually able to generate data. You know, some people said a long time ago that uh, if we wanted to use the uh, traditional techniques of physics and everything to try and recreate some data, it essentially involves simulating the entire universe to really try and recreate these things. But in the techniques we have nowadays, they're, they're probabilistic, they're stochastic in nature. And we're able to learn these data generating distributions. And this tells us a lot about the data. So what I, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So in the, in, the, in the presence of trying to create the data, we are learning a lot about it. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about. So representation learning. Good, fe good features are essential for successful machine learning. As we've been finding, um, any of you guys who have worked in something even related to this field, you know computer vision, they've got all of their features. Um, and, and signal processing, they've got all their features, all these handcrafted features that the, uh, the professionals have labored and toiled over over many years and published many papers on collectively to try and get these perfect features. So what they're doing, essentially, is they're assuming that the data is smooth ahead of time, but it's not. So they make these handcrafted features such that the data becomes smooth and they're able to learn again. So that's, that's the point of these handcrafted features. They're, they're very important, but they're very labor intensive. So we'd like to try and, and get away from that. Uh, good representations can capture the posterior belief about explanatory causes. And what it does is, this is an important word that's been thrown around a lot lately, is it disentangles these underlying factors of variation. So that's something that we're trying to understand a little bit better, a little bit better as well. So representation learning, what it does is it guesses what these factors and vari what these factors, these causes are. And if it's able to do that, that's what we would call a good representation. A representation is one which captures those. And this, again, is a, unfortunately for a lot of these priors that you have in machine learning, they're sort of wishy-washy, things that are uh, you convince yourself when you, it's like thinking in high dimensions. What does everybody do? They think in three dimensions and go 100 dimensions, 100 dimensions, 100 dimensions. It's, it's kind of a similar little technique here. Um, and one of the strong arguing factors for this that a lot of people bring up is looking at humans, the human brain. Again, we don't wholesomely understand it, but there are a lot of patterns that we see. And why not follow these patterns? Because they work for now. Even if we can't describe them, com them completely, it's a great place to start from. So humans develop representations and abstractions. Uh, and this enables them to solve problems and adapt to new situations very easily. So why don't we make our computers able to do the same? So these are things that, say, representation learning, trying to find some underlying explanation for our data, is going to be helpful in machine learning and generalizing and transferring knowledge to new tasks. So here's just an example for some audio processing. You take in the data, and you break it up into a bunch of little features. And then you put these features together in different ways, and you get different patterns. And then these can keep being put together to give us even higher level linguistic representations. This would be the process of transcription, speech recognition, that we all love and thank Google for so much. So what is a good representation? Now I'm saying what a representation is. Well, there doesn't exist a metric to really say this representation is better than this representation. Again, it's a little wishy-washy, but they're based off of priors, which they, they make sense. At least that's, that's, that's the, best, the best place we can start from. One, smoothness. We've talked about it. It's great. It's not good enough, but it's great. Whenever we can get it, keep it. If you can do some transformation to the data to make it smooth, do it. That's nice. Disentangling explanatory factors. So this, again, is distributed representations. right? This notion of allowing the data itself to be transformed into a space such that each dimension is describing an individual uh, factor of variation, explanatory factor. Compositionality. So what's that? That is the process of hierarchically assembling these small features. We can look at the visual cortex as a, as a role model. We've got the very first layer of V1 breaks things into small little lines, and then the next layer puts these lines together to make curves and edges, and then the next one makes you know 
shapes that we might recognize. These shapes then as assemble into faces, cars, houses, animals. So we want our representations to be able to, be able to do the same thing. Uh, so what's semi-supervised learning? That's the notion of, you know, we're trying to learn the representation of our data. That's P of X, the probability distribution of our data. If the probability dis distribution of our data is useful for predicting some label given the data, then it's a good representation. It's a simple prior. We, we say that if we can learn some structure in the data such that it's useful in classifying, then that's a useful structure. <laughs> Uh, shared factors across tasks. So this is a little different. This just says I want to learn structure in the data that's useful for one task. This says I want to somehow go back to my slide without doing that. This says I want to learn structure or learn some factors in the data that's useful across many tasks. And this turns out to be another very important uh, uh, leap that we've made in uh, machine learning recently. Manifolds, we've talked about it. Probability mass concentrates near low dimensional sub-manifolds. These are things that, uh, that these are the, some of the priors that we're putting into our current algorithms. Natural clustering. So as we said, local variations on the manifold preserve the category that we're in. If we create some sort of a representation that allows for small little perturbations on the manifold and maintaining our category, that's a good thing. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about autoencoders. There's a particular type of autoencoder called a contractive autoencoder. And it penalizes the gradient too, so that it does exactly that. As it's mapping something somewhere, it ensures that it has a small gradient such that translations don't move much. Right? These are things that we're explicitly coding into our algorithms. These are the priors that we're leveraging. Temporal and spatial coherence. Um, this is, uh, as I'm walking along up here, I'm moving at a certain rate, but my words are moving at a different rate. The screen is not moving at all. Right? There are different temporal properties in data, and being able to extract these uh, allow us to tease out some more like, fundamental structure in the data. There's actually a whole branch called slow factor analysis, SFA, where they do exactly that. They penalize their algorithms with uh, uh, f of t minus f of t plus 1 and just make that as small as possible. Whatever, factor, whatever factors they learn, they want them to not move much. Sparsity. Sparsity is extremely important. So this is related to distributed representations. So before we talked about, the, in that contrived example, there were just ones and zeros. But in general, distributed representations are not limited to binary classifications. Right? What we can have is some 10-dimensional representation where there are 10 different nodes, and each node assumes a certain value. And the question becomes, what is this notion of sparsity, and how does it relate to that? Well, think about, well, think of 10-dimensional space, which means think of three-dimensional space, and then say 10 dimensions. But think of 10-dimensional space where all of the axes are used equally as much. Right? You just get a lot of clustering of the data sort of smattered everywhere. Right? So, but what if we enforce sparsity in these representations? That means that we're only going to be using a few dimensions at a time. And we talked about the exponential nature of these, how all these different ones and zeros, how all these, uh, how if we have uh, 10 nodes, for example, we have 2 to the 10 different possible classifications. So we want that. We want to take this 10-dimensional space and allow for different regions to be leveraged to classify and recognize different things. So that's going to be very helpful in generalizing to new tasks. Oops. And then finally, uh, simple factor dependencies. So what that finally comes down to is saying that we'd like these explanatory factors to be related in a simple way, particularly linearly, if that's the case. We've observed that that is the case with physics in our universe. Why not uh, assume that that's the case for a lot of the other data that we look at? It's not always the case, but when it is, again, great, leverage it. All right. So learning features is better than handcrafting features. This, this, this is pretty clear. I mean, computer vision features, they've got the scale invariant feature transform, um, and then that was generalized to the rotation invariant feature transform. You've got the, uh, uh, what was it? Oops, that one is, what was that? The histogram of gradients, I think is what, the, yeah, histogram of gradients, right? These are all handcrafted features that people, just, that people have designed that enables classification tasks or machine learning tasks. And what these do, again, I talked about it a little bit earlier, what these features do is they allow a transformation of the data into a space such that the manifold is now smooth. What we want is a smooth manifold. If we don't have one, the machine learning task is difficult, and we have to find out how to distribute probability mass around this highly varying surface. So and before we were able to realize that, we were handcrafting features that were transforming space conveniently for us. All right, but as I said, it's labor intensive. This is, this is the weakness of our current techniques. So feature engineering was, was what was compensating for that weakness. That's how they were trying to fix this. Uh, and even more, you know, these are relatively simple tasks compared to the complex things that AI would hope to eventually tackle. 
And AI operates on a lot of knowledge. We can't possibly hope to input every little piece of information that we want our machine learning algorithms to learn. We have to learn how to learn. That's what it is. It's where to place the probability mass. All right. So how do humans generalize from very few examples? This, again, is another one of the observations that we've made in reality that has allowed us to make a new prior to make breakthroughs in current machine learning algorithms. OK, so first we come up with some sort of a representation that was learned from previous, uh, some, some previous task. So you could think, for example, if my job is to learn what cars are, and I'm a car expert, and then you come and show me a tricycle, I'm going to go, like, well, it's not a car, but cars move, and they have wheels. That has wheels. Maybe it's some mode of transportation or something, right? Transfer learning. You just, you, you've created some representation for cars, circles and things, some sort of functional semantic relationship between these things, and then generalize. This, have, this has to do with that distributed representation. We said, here's a car, and we said, each node, this is, this is the node for wheels, this is the node for made of metal, this is the node for it moves, right? And we took a tricycle, and we put the tricycle somewhere close enough to the car that we were able to actually draw some sort of semantic information about it. And that's the process of uh, transfer, transfer learning. This is multitask learning is actually what it's called. This is some work from uh, Hinton in 2006. This is when they, they discovered it. Basically, you have some input here, and it passes through multiple layers of transformations until you get some shared representation that is used across tasks. Okay? So this is even more general. This means that the representation I'm learning is constrained to be useful for multiple tasks. Right? Because the representations are task dependent. What if I want to recognize speech? Right? Maybe I would not be too interested in the, uh, the fluctuations in, in the person's voice, how far away they are from the microphone, et cetera. All I'm really interested in are phonemes and spacings and things like that to, to turn speech into text. Right? But what if instead I'm interested in recognizing somebody who's speaking? It's a different task, but it's faced with the same data. Now suddenly I am interested in the actual fluctuations of the voice. Maybe if it's a deep voice, it's a male. If it's a high voice, it's a female. So I don't want to learn one representation for, trans, for transcribing uh, speech into text. I want to learn a general representation that allows me to deal with many different tasks. And that is what we call disentangling of factors. You learn features for a specific task, and then disentangling is learning all practical uh, features that you want to use for different tasks. OK, so as I said, with that tricycle example, we, we pass this through some unsupervised representation learning algorithm, and we find some cool structure. We don't know what anything is, but there's clusters here. There's probability mass there. Life is grand. And then suddenly now, we get just a few examples. You know, Normally, you have hundreds and thousands of labeled examples. It takes a long time. You've got to pay undergrads you know, a whole lot of money, and they spend months labeling all this data for you. But now, all you need are a few examples, because you can tease out the structure beforehand using an unsupervised learning algorithm and then pass through just a few labeled examples, and suddenly you say, oh, well, this one's blue, and this one's, this one's whatever that is, magenta, and we get better generalization because of it. We are able to get the structure a priori just based on the statistics of the distribution. So this is another one of the, leverage, one of the advantages of using transfer knowledge, transfer learning. OK, but again, this isn't, there's another prior that we've imposed here, that somehow shared underlying explanatory factors are involved that each of these different tasks have things in common. Maybe that's the case. Maybe that's not the case. I think, in general, it's the case for a lot of things. But we need to be aware of these assumptions when we, as we move forward. So here's an example of where shared underlying factors are used. Over here, we have some features that have been extracted. They, call, they actually handcrafted these in computer vision a long time ago called textons. And then it turns out that we were actually able to learn these using convolutional neural networks. But these are some very fundamental low-level features that are extracted using our current algorithms. Turns out that these are used for many types of classification. A, for breaking faces up into small little regions, recognizing eyes, eyebrows, noses, and mouths. But also for recognizing maybe a wheel, maybe the bottom part of a car. You get some lines and curves and edges as they're put together. And so this is what I talked about before with the compositionality of these representations. That is another good, important feature for representation learning, to have compositionality. So these can then be put together. This is itself a representation, just as much as this was. And in fact, you could probably learn this independently of this in some different algorithm. But this is what we would call that lower level representation that is shared among tasks. This is what we would consider more valuable. So it's used for both of these tasks. This then comes into faces. These, all these and wheels and things are assembled into cars. And maybe we do facial recognition. Maybe we do um, 
identification. This is who this person is. This is their name. And here you do identify cars, etc. Okay, so some work that was done in 2009. But yeah, this was actually the, one of the big breakthroughs when we were able to visualize the layers and convolutional neural, neural networks and we realized that they were learning these underlying explanatory factors. This is one of the big motivating causes for us to begin uh, research in the field of representation learning. So here's something else that's very interesting. There are a lot of curious properties that have been arising from representation learning that we can't yet describe. For example, um, somebody created an algorithm on Mikulov in 2013 for representations of words. Right, and the learned representation space for these words somehow gave rise to this sort of like a semantic arithmetic. Right? The property is this. King minus queen is essentially roughly equal to man minus, man minus woman. Paris minus France plus Italy is equal to Rome. This is the, the, the space, of the representation space that was learned after having been projected down uh, using principal components analysis. And we can see, uh, you know, Italy over here to Rome and France over here to Paris. These vectors, this vector space that was learned somehow allows us to extract this curious uh, semantic arithmetic. We don't really understand why this happened. This just happens to be properties of very good representation spaces. Things like, you know, I say to you, if I just draw a circle and then put two little circles in it and then a curvy line at the bottom, you're all going to go, that's a face, right? But why? Like, how do we know that's a face so easily? Somehow we have some internal representation that allows for allows for very easy recognition of these things and giving rise to curious properties such as this semantic arithmetic. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about invariance and disentangling. So you have invariant features, but what are the different types of invariance you've got? As I said, scale invariance, rotation invariance. If it's speech, you want uh, you know, volume invariance or whatever it is that you're dealing with. Um, and what's important, though, is that for features alone, they depend on the task at hand, as we said a little bit earlier. Disentangling is the process of trying to learn all of the practical features ahead of time. And things like uh, multitask learning allow us to do that. We learn some representation that's useful in, useful in multiple tasks. But we don't know what these are a priori. How do we discover them? We need priors, such as the multitask learning, the assumption that there are underlying explanatory factors uh, that, that give rise to representations valuable in multiple tasks. Um, we also want to come up with some sort of an invariance to dimensionality, as we talked about with distributed representations. So here are just two examples. Uh, in 2009, Goodfellow and his colleagues came up with sparse autoencoders trained on images. And for some reason, the higher level features were more invariant to geometric factors of variation. Again, some of these curious properties that are just arising from good representation learning algorithms. We still don't wholesomely know what's going on. And this is 2009, and we still don't wholesomely know. <laughs> kind of exciting or maybe daunting at the same time. In Goro 2011, they actually were trying to do a, a linear discriminant analysis, and they found that they're able to discriminate between domain and sentiment, but they had certain features specialized in, rec in uh, identifying and recognizing domains versus sentiment, you know, feelings and things behind the different domains that you're working on. Okay, so now we're going to try and put it all together here. The underlying concept behind all of these things came out in like 1904, I think, um, with latent variable models, or at least the strategic linear latent variable models. And so we assume here that we have some correlation matrix, and in this example, we'll say we have grades of students from three different language courses, you know, Italian, Spanish, and Mandarin, okay? And we do a correlation matrix, and we find that all of these things are highly correlated. So what one might say then is that there's some underlying explanatory factor that's actually tying all these things together. That looking at all these individually isn't necessarily important. I need to find what the real factor is that's, that's affecting these. It's an assumption, but that was the assumption that was made then, and that's what gave rise to this, to this model that they come up with. So what he assumed then is that you have a random variable for each of these classes for the grades, and you have some shared factor here, and then you have some factor loading, as they call it, and then you have these unique, very, these unique factors for each person which you could chalk up to how much rest they got that morning, or essentially it's noise. <laughs> when you really boil it down, it, it comes out to being noise. All right, so yeah, S is the underlying common factor that we're looking at. And lambda, that's the factor loading, how much each of these factors contributed to this random variable, and then noise. So this can be extended to deal with multiple factors across many different variables, and generalize even further to a nice vector and a nice linear algebra notation here. So this is a little complicated because the only data we actually have is the x on this side. We don't know lambda, we don't know f, and we don't know u. 
Right? This is usually the case when we're dealing with statistics and variational inference and these kinds of uh, approaches. So we have to learn all of these things simultaneously. Um, or, as we do, you just make assumptions about their structure. So uh, we won't go through the details, but interestingly, uh, the covariance of x turns out to be defined in terms of only the factor loadings. So the features themselves, we don't actually learn the features themselves. We learn the, how much each feature contributes. This is, this is akin to principal components analysis. You don't actually learn what each dimension is. You just learn how much each dimension contributes. And then you plot your data and move it around to see what it actually is and sort of try and figure out what's going on. And uh, interestingly, this whole derivation here turns into principal components analysis when you allow this uh, matrix over here, when you allow this matrix over here to be uh, diagonal and it has only one value, you extract that out, then as this sigma turn goes down to zero, this whole technique turns into principal components analysis. And that's actually one of the limitations of principal components analysis is it's uh, restricted to homeoscedastic uh, changes in the noise while this one allows, well, general uh, factor analysis allows for heteroscedastic changes. All right, so now we're gonna go to the autoencoder which is a beautiful little construct. Um, the idea is that we have some data. We go through some nonlinear transformations to some representation internally here. And we then try to reconstruct the original data from this lower dimensional representation. Right? The constraint here is that this lower dimensional representation must somehow be sufficient enough to reconstruct the original data. It must somehow describe enough variation in the data to be able to reconstruct the data once again. All right, now, the number of dimensions matter. What if I have the number of dimensions of this be the same as the dimensions of the input? And what's to stop my autoencoder from learning the identity function? Right, it just maps it straight through. So that's why we have to impose uh, regularizers. Regularizers are very important, and there are a lot of different types of autoencoders that leverage them. Um, in general, it just maps input back to itself. Uh, this is the standard cost function, xi minus this new reconstructed xi. Um, so yeah, what, what prevents it from learning? Uh, just the identity? Regularization, which we just chalk up to some omega function we add to the end of the optimization routine there, the optimization cost function there. Um, so a denoising autoencoder is a very interesting one. Here's the model for that. We have our original data. We add a little bit of noise to it from some assumed noise distribution. We then learn our internal representation z. That's, that's this layer in here again. So we, we map this to Z, and then we try and reconstruct it once again and put all this into our cost function, the original and the, the, the latent variable representation there. What this actually learns is a vector field, curiously enough. The denoising autoencoder learns a vector field. If this is our low dimensional manifold right here, and these red X's are our actual data, the denoising autoencoder is learning a vector field which pushes things back on to this lower dimensional manifold. So indirectly, we're teasing apart structure of this manifold. We don't know the manifold itself, but we know the vector field around it, and it's giving us information about it. There's another one, sparse autoencoder. As we talked about earlier, you have uh, uh, a tremendous amount of nodes in the middle layer there, but you, you add this um, regularization constraint, which says we only want a few of these nodes active at a time. And this learns sparse distributed representations, which, which we talked about earlier, are very valuable, desirable. So that's what these learn. So as we talked about, uh, Autoencoders and principal components analysis are very similar. Um, oh, no, we didn't. That was for uh, factor analysis. But it turns out that autoencoders, if all it has in here is a linear activation function, it is principal components analysis. And it actually learns a basis which spans the exact same subspace as PCA. Might not be the exact same basis rotated or moved around, but it spans the same subspace. So how do they compare against one another? Well, here's just them uh, compared using um, the MNIST data set. So a uh, uh, principal components analysis, where you look at the first 30 dimensions, does this. If you use logistic, which gets away from that linear constraint, we're able to do a little bit better. If we do a, uh, an autoencoder with uh, 30 deep, which means uh, 30 dimensions in that representation layer with nonlinear transformations, it looks even better, and that's the real data. So autoencoders can perform a little bit better than principal components analysis. Hold on. On that, on that slide there, are we talking generation? Yeah, this is the reconstruction, not generation, so, reconstruction. Reconstruction, not generation. Oh, 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 okay. It's if we did, if we did an animation, reconstruction. Reconstruction. Yeah. This is reconstruction. Yeah. So uh, we're running out of time, so we're going to kind of fly through here. So the next most beautiful thing that uh, to come to machine learning is this notion of generative models. This ability to, as I said, instead of you know 
learn how to predict some variable given another, you learn the data generating distribution of what you're actually looking at and trying to understand. So that's where variational inference comes in. Uh, you have Bayesian inference here, which we've all seen uh, before, but unfortunately the posterior is intractable uh, most of the time. Um, and that's when this marginal probability down here is in some extremely high dimensional space and you have to deal with the you know, hundreds and thousands of intervals, right? So this becomes an intractable um, uh, problem to solve. So we approximate it. And the, the technique to this is to find a parameterized distribution that is as close as possible to the true. Okay, and so this is using a, something called the um, callback Leibler divergence, it's something that they use um, in information theory to measure the, essentially the, the difference between different distributions. So we're trying to find the parameter phi for our distribution, whatever we assume the structure to be, be it Gaussian or something, such that this is as small as possible. We want the, the divergence of the difference between them to be small. Um, and the, the divergence is defined as, as follows. Um, yeah, we won't go into those details in that time. So this is the structure here. We have uh, an encoder. We have our Q of phi. This is basically learning the latent representation. And what it learns is it learns a, a mean vector and it learns a standard deviation vector for whatever our assumed distribution is. That's our phi. If phi are the parameters of this. And then we learn these two sample from them to create some latent representation z and then pass them to the decoder and try and reconstruct the data again. So this is a beautiful regularizer. We are, we are imposing that the autoencoder actually learn these distributions, should they exist and should they assume the form that we assume these distributions to take. Okay, we don't have time for that. So research, what are we doing? So why are we doing this, right? So you guys, you might remember from our talk last year, um, essentially, we're working with the Max Planck Institute, and they are interested in us helping them understand their data. So there it is. They want us to help them understand their data. So initially, uh, we were trying to develop algorithms, uh, you know, as we talked about flux and calculations for flow. But we started leaning towards these machine learning algorithms that are designed to explicitly take out these, these features that are of interest. And the reason that we did that is because of a quote that I really like, which is up here. Uh, by Burke from 1812, he says, for when we define, we seem in danger of circumscribing the nature uh, of reality within the confines of our own notions. Right? So that's what was happening with the practitioners. They'd look at their experimental data, and then they'd be like, oh, well, that's a diffusive event, and that's that, and that's what that is. But in the act of doing that, they might be missing what's actually taking place. So I explained this to uh, the, the guy we're working with down at the uh, Max Planck Institute, and he says, you know, I, I really like that. He'd like for the data to speak for itself. He wants to learn the structure of the data from the data alone and remove any a priori assumption that the practitioner is imposing on it. All right, so, uh, yeah. So the two main questions that we've been asking is what is the optimal dimensionality of that latency space that we're interested in? And then something that Gordon has recently been exploring is uh, how to meaningfully sample from that latency space during generation. So, um, Here's the, in the search of dimensionality, we're faced with, um, I'll go quick. This is a variational autoencoder, and in the middle layer, you have some assumed form or distribution of this, uh, this prior distribution here. And the idea is that the entropy of that prior distribution is going to plateau if you're using a Gaussian mixture form, for example, and the Gaussian, the Gaussian nodes themselves become um, optimally separable or completely uninfluencing un one another. It plateaus and converges. So the idea was that maybe I'd use that to try and say how disentangled these factors of variation are. Right? If we're using a Gaussian mixture model to represent this posterior, I can keep changing the dimensionality of that latency space until I see that the entropy has plateaued. And once the entropy has plateaued, I say, well, these Gaussians are now optimally disentangled. They're optimally separated from one another. And maybe that would be a good place to start. So I've been experimenting with that. It turns out to be difficult because the standard variational autoencoder assumes uh, this mean field model, which is isotropic Gaussians, and it doesn't give us a whole lot of room to wiggle room to play with. Uh, but that's one thing we've been looking at. Um, isolated clusters also, these imply disentangling of the factors, so we could just look at the clusters themselves in that high dimensional space. Um, and unfortunately, there also just may not even exist a theoretical solution. Perhaps the representation truly is somehow dependent upon the task. Maybe even if a uh, very little bit, there might just be some intrinsic dependency on the task that, that, we, that we just don't yet know. Um, so Gordon's been looking at uh, trying to find out how to meaningfully sample from it. So here, for example, is the latency space of um, the MNIST data set. This is two dimensions. If you take all those characters that I showed you earlier and you map them to this latency space, 
this is the form that it assumes. Right now, again, this is Gaussian, right? This is this big Gaussian bell here. And here are where all of these, uh, the digits are at. So simple, the, this Gaussian, basically it constricts the data to be clustered in these n-dimensional cones. So if we're in two dimensions, we get this 2D cone, you know, a little bit, and higher and higher dimensions, we get these cones emanating away from the origin, or from the center of the Gaussian, from the mean. Uh, so interpolating from the cluster of ones right over here to the cluster of zeros, uh, this involves passing through this low, this low density region, this, this low probability region right here. And in doing that, you're actually generating data that's not realistic. You're generating something like a one and a zero superimposed on each other. And that's not what we want. So Gordon's trying to find a way to sample from this, uh, this uh, latency space in a meaningful way so that we can understand what the, what the generation of the data actually is. And this is similar to finding the optimal dimensionality. They're related to one another. So I'm kind of running out of space, so time. So yeah, thanks to our newly little nascent intelligence lab, Quan and Evan and Brian for helping and everything. Thanks to my buddy Ian. He actually works at Google now. You, you guys who knew him, he's a data, he works there in visualization. He actually works with the Google Brain team and he helped uh, bounce some ideas off me. He's actually helping visualize their auto encoders in some high dimensional space. So he and I were chatting about some techniques he was using. Um, what? Yeah, that's what I mean. For, so the, for those of you who know, Ian was one of our graduate students. He's a good friend of mine. He was one of uh, Gordon's students. And of course, thanks to Max Planck for the money and then FSU for the resources and support and all of you guys for letting me bother you from time to time, in particular Sachin. I go into his office and ask him questions all the time. Thanks. <laughs>